Well, hi, it's John Halamka, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I had the challenge of being both in Southern California and Tel Aviv on the same day. So I'm very happy to offer my comments on innovation via this recording. So of course, the first question you're all asking is, given the Trump administration, what is the impact on healthcare and healthcare IT? And, and how do we think about innovation in the context of what is going to be a new administration? I, of course, have no inside information whatsoever. I served the Bush administration for four years, the Obama administration for six years. I really don't know any of the characters that are being assigned to work in the Trump administration. However, I have talked to several of the folks uh, who have been nominated, and I have talked to several of the career folks who are going to be there serving the new administration. Because remember, uh, when you have a political appointee, you know, they come, they go. But the career people are there across administrations. They more or less last forever and are the folks who actually implement policy. So what can we expect? So in speaking with folks in Washington, what they all say is, it is highly unlikely we're going to roll back to what I'll call fee-for-service medicine, rewarding doctors and hospitals for more care as opposed to quality and outcomes. So although it's absolutely true, you might see the bundled payment program go away, you might very well see you know, some new proposals around Medicaid and premiums and those sorts of things, you're certainly still going to see a drive to quality and outcomes. So when we think about MACRA and MIPS, quality payment program, all these things that have been put into regulation, remember, they're not executive orders, they're regulations. So regulation, sure, can it be changed? Yes, but it takes a long time, and everyone in Washington is set to execute on the quality payment program beginning measurement periods in 2017 and then enforcement of change in 2018, 2019. So I think we can say the next couple of years will require us to develop the tools necessary for population health and precision medicine. And we should absolutely all be thinking about big data analytics, and I'll talk about that in some detail. So think about today's electronic health records, which were transactional systems designed for meaningful use. They may not be totally fit for purpose in a world that is value-based purchasing. So just keep this in mind as we talk about innovation over the next 20 minutes or so, that the Trump administration is still going to want us to bend the cost curve, is still want us to benchmark and analyze and to deliver right care, right time, right patient. It's not just going to be about rewarding more care. Second thing, probably true, you're probably going to see a reduction in some of the NIH-funded programs. So you could guess that future funding, not current funding, but future funding for things like the cancer moonshot, you know, programs may not be totally funded yet, and that may be in jeopardy. You might see the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation not get future funding to a great extent. You might see precision medicine not funded to as great an extent. So. I, I guess we should be careful in looking at some of those programs that were launched during the Obama administration that might require approval of future funding. They may have very well reductions in such funding. And then I think as we go forward, you know, you recognize that some of the things that have been on the, the trends of meaningful use, patient family engagement, data, information sharing, making sure that the ecosystem of healthcare is digital, of course, you know, these are going to continue because these are not so much government driven at this point, they're cultural issues. Patients are now expecting the kind of convenience they get on their mobile apps for healthcare. So let's now recognize that healthcare IT is not going to radically change on January 21st. There will be some subtle changes, there will be evolution, not revolution. So with that context, what do we do for innovation? Well, when I think of innovation over 2017, I break it into social, mobile, analytics, cloud, and keeping things private. So social. What do I mean by that? Today, if you were to have to coordinate a team of people, a doctor, a nurse, a physical therapist, a social worker, a pharmacist, and you were Facebook friends with them, would it be easier to use your EHR to coordinate this team of people to do something, or Facebook? My guess is probably Facebook. And why? 
Well, when we think of Facebook, it's really organized for threaded communications across groups of people with views of events. There's a wall that shows you what's going on and a status and these sorts of things. EHR really optimized for capturing data for billing around an encounter of care in a specific place by a specific person. So I think as we innovate, we need to think of those mobile apps that are going to layer on top of multiple EHRs. They're going to provide the Facebook wall for the patient. The notion of a Wikipedia-like authoring system where multiple participants, the patients, the families, the nurse, the doctor, the social worker, all can contribute to what's the care plan? What's the current progress? And these are the kinds of communication tools I see lacking today. Now, I have asked the folks at Facebook if Facebook for Business, which in effect is optimized for more of a private environment, could potentially be covered under a business associate agreement. The answer I've heard is no. You know, Facebook won't sign a BAA doesn't want patient data on the Facebook servers or cloud. Well, what about companies like Slack? Groupware you know, certainly used in corporate America. The answer is no, they won't sign a business associate agreement. So I think the, the time is ripe for some social networking software that is bringing together teams of people for care coordination, including patients and families, that is covered under a BAA with indemnifications and is somehow integrated into the electronic health record workflow. So, haven't seen it in the market, absolutely something that's necessary. Let's see what the next year brings. Now, what about mobile? Today, 80% of all accesses of Beth Israel Deaconess public websites are done from mobile devices. From your iPhones and your iPads and no Samsung, no Galaxy 7s, you know, no one uses those anymore. But yes, yeah, sure, we do get Android access. And so how is it we can think of the applications in the future that are all going to be mobile based? Well, let me give you an example of how an interaction might work. And this is all value-based purchasing. And as folks who know me realize, my wife and I have no privacy, so totally fine for me to share this with you. My wife was recently diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. She came to me and said, I've had an unexpected weight loss. My heart rate's about 110, 120 all the time. My hair feels brittle. My eyebrow hair is falling out. You know, symptoms of hyperthyroid disease. So I say to her, you need to contact your PCP and make sure you have a TSH, a T3, T4 measured, standard thyroid tests. So what does she do? She picks out her phone, clicks on a Beth Israel Deaconess app, communicates securely with her primary care physician and describes the symptoms and the probable need for testing. That primary care doc knows her very well, knows that I'm a doctor, knows that it's probably safe to just move forward to an initial screening test and on her phone orders a set of tests to be done at a local laboratory two miles from our house. No need to drive into downtown Boston, fight traffic, pay for parking, that kind of thing. My wife goes to the local lab. Within two hours, the lab results appear on her phone. She sees that her TSH is zero, her T3, T4, five times normal, that she has hyperthyroidism. So she then gets to secure message her PCP again, and says probably need a referral to a specialist. PCP uses her phone to arrange a referral with a specialist and turns out the appointment is the next day in a local suburban setting two miles from our home. My wife visits the endocrinologist. One more lab test is done, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, and we get the diagnosis. She has Graves' disease, which is treatable in three ways, thyroid surgery, radiation ablation, or a simple medication, methamazole. My wife says, my preference is to start with a medication. The endocrinologist then on her phone electronically prescribes methamazole, 10 milligrams, to be delivered to the Walgreens 25 feet from our farm. So my wife, of course, just walks to the pharmacy, picks up the medication, takes the medication, today is doing fine, and what I've just described to you is a set of interactions on mobile devices that involves the patient, the PCP, the specialist, 
the pharmacy, the lab. But it all is done with simple mobile apps. Not a lot of driving and parking, and no one needs to use a desktop. And that's the kind of workflow that in a world of value-based purchasing, where you're rewarded for outcomes and quality and the patient experience that we really need. Now we're starting to see some such apps roll out and what you hope is that as our EHR vendors, as Epic and Cerner and Meditech and these folks implement the fire-based interfaces, the fast uh, healthcare interoperability resources interfaces, that apps that layer on top of EHR transactional systems and offer these kinds of experiences will become more and more common. I think you'll see curated app stores and that provider organizations will offer such apps that may be authored by third parties but are approved as being interoperable, secure, good enough, and to really make the patient and family experience better. We've also created an app at Beth Israel Deaconess called My ICU, which enables patients and families to download an app and then see a dashboard of the progress of their loved one in the ICU. What are the care goals? What will happen today? How is that patient doing with regard to care goals? What are some care preferences and maybe communication preferences of the family and the patient with the care team? And this app, this dashboard, becomes the way in which care is coordinated in the ICU. So again, you're going to see more of that kind of thing. Now what about analytics? Of course, big data. Not sure what that means. I, I have four petabytes of data. Is that a lot? Is it big? I don't know. But what is it we need to do in 2017 to innovate? Another example for you. My wife, uh, now 54, so 50 at the time, uh, was diagnosed with uh, stage 3A breast cancer. And when she was diagnosed, the big question we had is for Asian females at age 50, what were the morbidity and mortality? What were the drugs used? What are the side effects? What are the things we should be concerned about in the treatment of breast cancer? Now, as the CIO of the Beth Israel Deacon System, I have access, uh, with appropriate oversight, of course, to two million patient records. But also as a Harvard professor and a member of the Harvard community, there's 17 Harvard hospitals with about five million patient records. And again, with appropriate oversight and controls and IRB and human subjects and all the rest, this corpus of data in an anonymized, aggregated fashion can be used to inform care. So we actually looked at patients like her and determined that the combination of adriamycin, cytoxin, um, you know, and taxol was actually a reasonable chemotherapeutic regimen. However, Asian women are very sensitive to taxol. Causes numbness, neuropathy in the hands and feet. Is there a clinical trial we could reference? Well, no. So we had to do a clinical trial of one. And what that means is for my wife, we reduced her taxol dose by 50%. And we agreed with her team of caregivers that should there be a challenge with the cancer becoming more aggressive or whatever, of course we could modify, but let's try. And so after chemotherapy, she was in complete remission and now five years out in complete remission, but her hands and feet working fine, side effects minimal. And this is the kind of thing I think of big data analytics is using the data of the past to inform the care of the future leveraging the experience of patients like you. Now, of course, we also use big data for things like quality measures and population health and care management. And maybe there's another area we need to focus on, which is, uh, let's say I have 4,000 diabetic patients in my panel, and I need to understand who has gaps in care, who hasn't had an eye exam, a foot exam, who's got a hemoglobin A1C greater than nine, and EHR really mostly optimized for caring for a patient today as opposed to keeping a patient well in the context of a population of patients with a given disease. So I think we also need big data analytic tools that can analyze individuals for belonging to a cohort, patients with diabetes, and then play those patients against a guideline, a pathway, a protocol, and look for gaps in care 
and then provide the workflow tools necessary to close those gaps. Think of it as a customer relationship management system of sorts for healthcare. I haven't really seen that. Well, finally, cloud. Now, what do I mean by cloud? Because again, you have to be very careful when people say, we've got a cloud. Well, where is your cloud? Oh, it's below ground in New York City. And oh, New York City would never have a flood, so it's a safe cloud. Oh, guess what? We have you know, hurricanes suddenly coming up the East Coast, and suddenly there's a flood, and suddenly the cloud is gone. So cloud. Distributed hardware, which is redundant to the point where I do not see an eruption of service operated by a third party with appropriate controls for security and reliability. Beth Israel Deaconess over the last year has looked to Google, looked to Amazon, looked to Dell and now its successor NTT Data for hosting clinical applications with service level agreements, business associate agreements, and a you know, level of monitoring that would actually be better than we might be able to do ourselves. And so to ask you, you know, a question, if, if there's a denial of service attack on the internet, who's going to know about it first? My five engineers or the 5,000 that work for Amazon? Yeah, probably Amazon. So although many boards of directors say, oh, the cloud's scary, you lose control, I actually think of the cloud as risk mitigation, potentially better quality services at a lower price, purely because of the scale of the organizations providing such services. So I think you'll see us as an organization creating a variety of groupware and social interactions that are delivered on mobile devices, that are supported by big data analytics, but actually all hosted in places like Amazon and Google. So our contracts, for example, with Amazon are to use the Hadoop distributed data analytics services for support of our big data and for using uh, AWS and S3 for hosting compute and data for a number of our applications. And Google for Google productivity tools and Hangout and Drive and Gmail and calendaring. You know, all of this is still in the, what I'll call pilot and experimental phase but it seems like we will be able to reduce cost and improve function. Now the last letter, because I've spelled S-M-A-C, is K, keep it private. So here we have our acronym, SMAC, for innovation. Keeping all of this data in its appropriate, closed, HIPAA compliant, regulated and analyzed containers, not spilled to anyone, but shared appropriately is what, of course, we need to do. And this is a dizzying uh, complexity because what we see in a world today is East German hackers trying to steal data for ill-gotten financial gain. But I'll tell you, yes, fine, you can outsource your security and air security monitoring and use these cloud-based uh, systems as I've talked about, but you must educate your population. We are as vulnerable as our most gullible employee, the one that clicks on the link, the one that provides their username and password to a hacker. It's the social engineering and the phishing attacks I worry about most. So as you build your new innovative applications, don't forget about the need to educate your users about, don't click on that link. Don't pick up the USB drive and insert it into your computer. You know, don't download Angry Birds from BulgarianGamesOnline.com. This is really essential. So I hope you have a good conference. And I hope that as you go forward and you innovate, that these are some of the areas in which you create new applications and services. And we will create a digital healthcare innovation ecosystem in the United States in the context of the new administration and the mandate to improve quality, value, safety, and efficiency. So again, I apologize I couldn't be there, but uh, I will, of course, be always connected via my blog and email, and I will follow your great innovations. And my mom lives in Southern California. So remind, you know, it's very important. Whatever you guys do to innovate will help my family directly. Have a great day.